episode 179, featuring the fourth and final installment of my interview with the Shadowgate designer, Mr. David Marsh. In this part of the interview, we talk about his MMOs, including Starship Troopers Online and Aliens Online. We also talk about some of the more obscure reports of Shadowgate, including one uh, for the Palm operating system. And then I ask him the question sent in by you guys. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. David Marsh. Yeah, this is 19, 1993 when right. ICOM was uh, purchased or acquired by Viacom New Media. So I was wondering, was this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, you know, um, I think it was a good thing because, um, you know, we were really struggling as a company, as a small company, like many of the other uh, game companies that, that were out at that time. Um, so it was a good thing that they came in and bought us. Um, you know, with that, you know, the, their expectations and the, some of the things that they wanted to do um, at that time were, you know, were not um, maybe, you know, maybe we weren't the best company to, to be aligned with to do some of the stuff that they wanted to do. Um, so it was good. It was good and bad. The people at Viacom were nice and, and they, they were great and everything, uh, they, but they were pretty much all TV people. Um, we loved the people at MTV and Nickelodeon. They, you know, they we worked well with them. Uh, but the, you know, it's just the kind of products that that we wanted to work on as this game company, and the kind of products that that they wanted us to focus on um, were sometimes at odds. I mean, I really enjoyed making Beavis and Butthead games. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, but there were other properties that we really struggled with, and. Um, it was also around the time that the big media companies were saying, hey, making games is easy, let's jump in and do it. But uh, I have, you know, I really have nothing, uh, you know, other than respect for the people that I worked with. And it was just, um, it just, I don't think it was just great synergies. What can you tell me about this game, MTV's Club Dead? What do you want I was looking at the <laughs> box on Moby Games, and that really looks bizarre. It is a, it is a, a freakishly bizarre game. And um, so I was finishing up Dracula Unleashed, and they said, well, we still want to do something FMV, and we want to do it with MTV. And so would you, would you produce it? And I said, sure, I'm, I'm just not an MTV guy, but I would be, I'd be more than happy. Well, we'll hook you up with the people that, that are, and which they did, which were great people. And there was a, there was a, uh, a company in Chicago um, that, uh, that was a special effects kind of company and so we actually hired them to um, their, their name was H gun and uh, hired them to go ahead and do all the background designs and 3d stuff which was just kind of coming just starting back then and um, and shoot it all on, on, on green screen and it was just gonna be a trippy weird strange experience of of this 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 like instead of Club Med, I mean, it was a resort that was just insane, and so uh, we shot it all on sound uh, on a sound stage, a green screen sound stage in Chicago, and um, had a blast doing it. And um, it went out, and I think at that time they kind of said, "Okay, well, we're done with that, so let's move on." And so it just went away. But um, very interesting project, you know, my last FMV really. So. Um, if you watch it, if you look it up on YouTube and, and watch it, and it's really hard to watch the videos because they're so grainy. But um, you're, you'll, you'd ask yourselves, what are these guys on? It's just, it's so, so out there. So what were you on? Uh, I wasn't on anything, uh, uh, you know. And uh, but um, the, you know, the design for it was just to do something uh, very trippy, and so uh, that's exactly what it was. But it's been, but we shot a multiple. I mean, it was very much like Dracula Unleashed. It was pretty much the same type of thing over a course of days and shooting, you know, videos and different endings depending on what you go into the scene with and your inventory and stuff. And um, but it was um, it was quite the trip. So around this time, uh, we get the Shadowgate Classic, right? Uh, for Game Boy Color and Palm yeah. OS. Uh, you know, I don't know much about Palm OS. I'm kind of curious about, about that port. And uh, I just wonder, what, how was, uh, was this well received, uh, Shadowgate Classic? Yeah, yeah, really well received on Game Boy Color. Really excited Game Boy Color. that came out and, uh, and getting it out there. And people that had played it on the NES were excited about playing it again on the Game Boy Color. So 
Uh, the game had done well. Um, I think you can still buy copies of it out there. Uh, I think Vatical might still be selling it. Um, but it was, uh, it was just a, again, it was a port. Uh, and it was uh, just fun to work on with those guys and, and uh, with Kemco again. And it was, um, it was just neat to work on it. The games that we had done for the Pocket PC and Palm, you know, part of it is when you look at platforms is you have to ask yourself, is this going to be a gaming platform? Is this something that people are going to want to do? Now, of course, you know, those those devices were, you know, ahead of their time or behind their time, whatever however you want to look at it. But um, obviously, phones now are a gaming platform and they've observed, um, you know, things like, um, you know, handheld game devices. And so... Uh, again, we took a chance and just said, is this going to be a platform that people are going to want to play these games on? And so we had actually made them across for multiple devices, Palm and Pocket PC devices, um, you know, and, uh, and sold those. But again, the, you know, those ended up the whole idea of syncing, you know, uh, you know, this, this kind of smartphone device thing uh, just ended up not working well for, for games. Would you say that's the most obscure platform you've made a game for? Very few people even know that that those were ever released or they existed, and so uh, that's why I think I was um, I waited. I mean, I you know Eugene and I had kept in contact for years, and we still do. We still talk you know every week. But you know when I was talking about the Shadowgate license and the licenses that he had and stuff like that, I um, I really didn't want to go into um, that that. Um, that property again until I felt like that there was a platform out there that could really um, take advantage of it and that was it was going to do well on. Um, you know, to pour a lot, that much time and, and money into a platform would be, you know, be difficult if it wasn't, you know, going to be um, widely distributed. So that's why it works so well to to work on the, the new version of Shadowgate. Well, around this around this time, you started getting involved in some MMOs. I was reading about some of these uh, aliens online, which I believe I, and Sandy Peterson, I interviewed him not too long ago, and I, I, I could be misremembering this, but I, I could have sworn I heard him mention this uh, aliens online game. Uh, so I'm just wondering, uh, what about aliens online? So um, about and about 1997, I had um, uh, Viacom was shutting down the Chicago office, and I had gotten a job offer from uh, Kesmai which was a massively multiplayer game. In fact, they made the, really the first commercial massively multiplayer games on Genie and other devices. And so it was really neat to, um, to, come, to come here to Virginia and to work on that. And because I had worked with Paramount and, and, um, and Warner Brothers and worked on some licenses, they were looking for a producer to go ahead and, and work with the licenses that they had. And so Mythic Entertainment, which is the Dark Age of Camelot folks, which is now Mythic Bioware, um, they were working on Aliens Online for Kesmine, you know, to produce it. So they just needed an executive producer, which is what I did. Um, so uh, it was going to be for our GameStorm system or our GameStorm platform. And so I just worked, um, you know, as the liaison for, for, uh, for Kesmine between them and Mythic and them and... Uh, and the folks uh, at Fox that owned the Aliens license. And so that was pretty much my involvement was to just make sure that the game was getting done, you know, from a Kesmai standpoint. And the guys at Mythic were wonderful to work with. And then, uh, and then that the licensor uh, liked it. So that's really what I was doing. So when I was working on that in Starship Troopers, in Silent Death, and I think I, I might have been the executive producer on Godzilla Online, some of these titles that we were putting out on the uh, GameStorm site on Kesmai, um, pretty much, other than making some games internally for Kesmai, I was the um, I was the executive producer for those that Mythic was working on while they were right before their success with Dark Age. Why? What, what happened to these games, so especially Star, uh, Starship Troopers Online? As soon as I saw the title, I thought that's a brilliant, you know, license. I mean, because right. watching the movie, it almost feels like you're watching a, a, a game already. In, in right. Middle, so. Right. I mean, why why weren't these games so successful? Well, um, at that time, uh, Electronic Arts came in, and we were making games for AOL, and uh, Electronic Arts was interested in, in uh, getting games on AOL as well and starting EA.com. And so um, Electronic Arts actually bought Kesmai and wanted to develop their own, their own platform, which was EA.com. And so the GameStorm platform pretty much went away. 
So that's pretty much why those games um, you know, kind of went by the wayside. So we continued to work on Battletech 3025. Um, Nick Lyacona was the producer of that. And then um, when he left, I, I took it over. Um, and then we worked on a new version of Air Warrior, um, the Millennium Edition. So we were working on a couple of those, plus some um, casual games for AOL, you know, poker and euchre, or euchre, whatever that, euchre, I guess, uh, and a number of other games. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, we were concentrating on the stuff that EA cared about, which was um, creating stuff for a new platform and not what we had previously done. Seems like a lost or missed opportunity there on EA's part. Uh, I don't, you know, it's it's tough to, you know, it's tough to say. I mean, they they really wanted us to to really focus down on less games and and games that would work well on their platform, and so I mean that seemed to make sense. And um, you know, enjoyed working with those guys. Uh, you know, the kind of projects we work on. I mean, I love working on BattleTech, and um, you know, it was it was a it was a neat again, it was a neat time, but um, it was a shame that you know, I mean, Aliens was a lot of fun to play. The guys at Mythic did a great job, you know, between, you know, you could play either a Marine or an Alien, and it was a first-person shooter, and it was a blast, and the, and the levels were really well done. Um, I liked, you know, I liked Starship Troopers. I liked the fact that you could, you had this top, I was always a fan of top-down shooters, and, you know, you could choose to be an Alien, and you could pick up an asteroid and whip it at, you know, and launch it across the screen. I mean, it was great fun. Um, and then also at that time, Mythic had just, launched Dark Age of Camelot. It was so, it, it was such an overnight success and they were concentrating on that. So, you know, getting bug fixes for Alien was a little, Aliens was a little difficult, you know. So, uh, you know, it was it was an interesting time working on MMOs. Uh, so out of all the people I've interviewed, I think you're the one that's got to be on the top list, at least, of working on this, as many platforms as you have. You know, all these different ports. Yeah, so I think there's like, some obscure ones. So yeah, I think if I think about it, it's been like twenty different platforms. It's pretty between the Japanese market and the American market, and just you know, consumer electronics. It's been uh, it's been a blast. So, what lessons have you learned from all these working on all these uh, different machines? Well, the, uh, probably the biggest one is um, it's like innovation. Innovation in general, um, there's two types of innovation. There's radical innovation, which is somebody that creates something that is that has never been seen before. And then there's incremental, incremental innovation, which is taking something that has already been innovated uh, on, and then you, um, you make it a little different or a little bit better or you alter it. And um, I always ended up being in, in the cases, um, you know, both, you know, companies and projects that were innovative projects. Uh, but innovation doesn't always translate into, uh, you know, revenues. Um, usually it's somebody, you know, tries something and if it, um, on some new platform and uh, you create for it and you see if it works. For example, that you were talking about um, playing Sherlock on DVD, which is a really neat, you know, a neat system and how we put it together. And, um, but it was, and while it was innovative on how we got, went ahead and created that, we were unsure whether or not DVD was ever going to take off as a gaming platform, which, with the exception of one product, um, which was the Scenic Games, uh, they it, it never it, it never was. I mean, DVD in general never was a gaming platform. And so, um, one of the things I learned at is you have to be very committed to try something new on a new platform and um, realize that it may or may not be uh, financially, uh, you know, valuable. I mean, it, it, it you know, it, it can be very, very difficult. And so, um, and so we, I've always felt like uh, I've never been afraid of going out there and trying something new and trying a new platform and seeing if it works uh, because I always learn something new from that platform. But it's a real hit or miss thing, you know. Right now, we're learning that things like, um, you know, obviously iPads and Android devices and, and phones and everything are a gaming device. And so it's easier to, you know, to decide to go ahead and, and create a game for that. Um, but uh, I don't know. I guess, you know, the key, you know, is, uh, you know, that I've learned is uh, every platform is not going to be a gaming platform. And if I want to be in gaming, I need to, um, you know, continue to try to, you know, make new products for new markets and see what happens. You know, whether that's, 
um, you know, for DVD or, or interactive television. I mean, I want to go ahead and continue to look at, at those things and put myself out there. I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid of failing. Um, I would, um, I, I, I'm just more excited about trying new things and seeing and making great products for new, to new, new platforms. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Yeah, that's great. Never, I actually have a question here. It might, this might be related. Uh, this is a question from a viewer. Uh, this is, his name is Denise. Dennis, Dennis, Denis, I'm not sure. Hopefully one of those is right. <laughs> uh, Opal. Uh, so he says, as a game developer, I would like to hear your thoughts on what we have left behind in design over the decades that we should rediscover. Well, I think the biggest thing is, um, you know, uh, the games that I used to play uh, when I played them for, um, uh, you know, uh, on some of the earlier platforms, even just going back to d playing tabletop D and D, um, is that uh, story and, and gameplay is king. It's everything, and if it's not fun, it doesn't matter what license you throw at it. It doesn't matter how many great, you know, what kind of great graphics you've got at it, or you know, what's accelerated, or the kind of music you put in, or the cut screens where the guys, you know, attacking with a sword and he goes into slow motion and then it comes down and hits you with the sword. None of that matters if the gameplay isn't fun and if that game experience isn't fun. And if the user interface isn't very, very sleek, there are so many good companies that are making games out right now that are combining all of those things. Um, of course, it costs $10 million to develop those games. Uh, and, uh, you, know, in a, you know, in the words of EA, go big or go home. So um, I think there are still a lot of uh, great small indie companies like our company that uh, realize that you know it's really just all about the gameplay. Now we want to go ahead, and you have to compete with um, the ex or, or reach the expectations of people that have great art and great audio, and um, and that's that's you know that's a given. But if the gameplay, uh, in which a lot of those earlier games really had, if the gameplay isn't uh, up to par, then none of that other stuff matters. It's really just like. Like people look at um, Hollywood these days, they're like, you know what, Michael Bay, stop blowing stuff up. We get it. You can blow up stuff with the best of it, but if it's not a compelling story, we're just not interested. All right. So one last question here. Yeah. And uh, so, what advice do you have? I have you know, I have a lot of students who watch the show. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what advice do you have for students or even kids uh, who want to get into the games industry right. today? Uh, what kind of stuff would you look for on a resume? Well, you know, uh, I will tell you that the key is, uh, it depends on where you want to come in from. If you have uh, an ability to program, uh, what you should be doing is, there are a lot of, um, I mean, there's a lot of freeware out there of things that you can, that you can get, or uh, things that are very cheap um, to develop games and game ideas uh, on your own for various platforms. And uh, for example, um, you know, you can, there, there's tons of, you know, not tons, but there's a, you know, a handful of, of companies out there that are offering uh, either ch either free or cheap to, um, you know, program in Java, in Flash, um, in Lua, in some of these uh, visual based, uh, visual, visual um, type programming um, languages. That you can uh, that you can get a hold of right now, and uh, you can start programming a game for a an iPad or an Android device. Uh, and you know, I would just start right there. Take whatever idea that you've got and start programming it. If you're if you're into programming, even if it means that you're doing your own art or whatever, that's a great way to start because companies want to see that you've been doing something, that you've got an idea, that you've you know figured out how to do some physics, or that you came up with a, a way of bringing a user interface that maybe they haven't seen before, or just solid, solid game code. Um, if you're an artist, uh, you know, I see a lot of artists, a lot of 3D artists. Um, you know, how does your game, you know, what can you go ahead and produce in the lowest number of polygons possible if you're a 3D artist? Um, a, lot of, a lot of great 3D artists can do stuff in high polygon work and uh, millions of polygons and make it look stunning. But other than a cut, some cut screen from a game, it's not going to be able to run on the, you know, on the PC. So what can you do in the lowest number of polygons? Um, can you, if you're a 3D artist, can you uh, do everything? Can you create um, the, the skeleton? Can you rig it? Can you animate it? Can you texture map, uh, map it? Um, 
especially game companies these days are looking for somebody that can do all those things. So uh, there's a lot of great 3D software out there. Some of it, you know, you can get very cheap. You know, others of it, you know. Uh, in fact, I, I, see, I, I seem to think that, um, you know, Adobe is offering their, their system now that you can pay by the month. And so, um, you know, there's great tutorials on that. So um, let's say you're not an artist or you're not a programmer, but maybe you are, um, that you love games. Um, test games. Get games out there, you know, play games. Uh, you know, get involved in, ask to be involved in the beta test program. Um, put together a resume that says, you know, I love, I love doing QA. QA and testing is a lot of work. Play the same things over and over. I know that you know that, Matt. You, know, you say that you play, you know, but um, you know those are things people are always looking for testers. Um, so there are different, you know, different things. You know, there's a lot of sound people out there. Uh, score something that has already been done, or find some game, you know, some game footage from your favorite game and score it yourself, and put in sound design and effects on there, and and send it to that company. And said, look, you know, I played your game, I loved your game, I scored it for you. Can give me a job. Be aggressive. So. It is tougher to get into the game industry than it was, um, you know, back when I got in in '85 because there were a lot less people in it. Um, but th there's a lot more tools available to you now, so and just don't give up on it. You know, I, I don't. In everything I've done, I've never given up. I always keep putting myself out there. Be ready for failure. Uh, pick yourself up again. I know that sounds cliche-ish, but um, just do it and uh, you know and continue to play games. And, uh, you know, and put yourself out there because um, people in game companies want to see other people that are aggressive. That's a really great and unique advice. You're the first person I've had on that's talked about scoring a scene from an existing game or uh, for an artist to focus on low polygon counts. Uh, well, good I'll tell you, I found my, I found my musician for um, the new version of Shadowgate, a guy named Rich Douglas. He's phenomenal. He's Go to richdouglas.net, uh, Douglas with one S. And he's ridiculous. And you know how I found him, uh, man? It's really interesting. I was um, sitting on the beach uh, over the summer, and we were just starting to think about the pre-production of what we are going to do for Shadowgate and starting to look at art and audio. And um, I just went on YouTube, and I typed in Shadowgate music. And uh, Rich's video came up, and, um, and he said, I'm a big Shadowgate fan. And uh, I thought I would score this. I love this piece of music um, from the beginning of the game, and I'm going to score it. Tell me what you guys think. And I was just blown away that somebody would do that. I was honored that somebody would take that, that, that particular piece of music and make it neat. And so I fired him off an email there sitting on, on the beach. And uh, I just said, I'm, you know, I'm Dave, and I'm working on starting, getting ready to start a new Shadowgate, and would you be interested in scoring it? And two hours later, he said, dude, I'm all over that. I would love to do that, and um, that's kind of how we got started. But I would have never found him or never known anything about him had he not posted that. And uh, I was really amazed. So I uh, use YouTube, use Facebook, um, you know, uh, it, it send your stuff to the gaming companies. There's so many out there now, especially small indie companies. Don't be afraid to say, I'll work for contract work, you know, because that's a lot of them are, are going to, you know, can only offer contract work. Um, but uh, you know, just let them know what you can do. I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll score, you know, I'll score it for half price to get to get my foot in the door. So um, don't be afraid to do that. I've, I've put hundreds of hours into the games I've worked on for nothing because I wanted to go ahead and and um, and make them or get in, you know, with a, a you know with a company. Well, Dave, a lot of people might not realize that you have a double life. Or an alias as a as a novelist. So you got a novel out, right? It's great right. stuff. Uh, where, what uh, can you tell me a little bit about it? Then uh, where can people where people can go if they want to buy it? Sure. Um, well, it's called the Solstice Treaty, and uh, you can find it on um, on Amazon. And um, basically, I, under my pseudonym, which is uh, my pen name, David Belltower. And the reason I didn't do Dave Marsh is there already is an author named Dave Marsh. He, Dave does a lot of great books on uh, rock and roll history. I still get emails every now and then where somebody says, what do you think Bruce Springsteen blah, blah. I go, I, I don't know. I'm the wrong guy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I had an idea of, of uh, I was always a big fan of a, of a movie called Wizards. Do you remember that movie? 
Wizards. Wizards. Uh, it's done by Ralph Bashke. It's uh, a cartoon, right? It's a cartoon, yeah. Animated film. And, uh, and it combined fantasy and, and World War II. And I've, I'm, a, I'm a World War II uh, Civil War nut. And um, I also uh, love fantasy, obviously, uh, in all forms. And uh, I just decided what, you know, how could I combine um, a book that has both of those things, that has an urban fantasy feel, um, and then a more of a high fantasy feel, and then, um, you know, World War II history. And so that's what I did. I, I just, um, I guess without giving away too much of the plot, you know, I've got my protagonists that are in modern day um, West Virginia, and uh, they get caught up in a, um, in a pact made between uh, um, a German officer in 1945 and uh, an otherworldly realm and so it's um it's just kind of a neat thing if you're if you're into um romance vampire romance you're not going to uh, be into this book but if you like fantasy and urban fantasy and uh and um and world war ii or some history part um uh, i think you'll really enjoy it so all of my uh fans who also like twilight uh <laughs> <laughs> Need not apply, but everyone else. Yeah, I mean, definitely get you know, a copy. Of this Twilight stuff. definitely is a fantasy book, you know, in its own realm, an urban fantasy, uh, certainly. And uh, I, you know, I do have a love story that's somewhere in there. <laughs> so you may like it. Um, you know, I would. Uh, it's it's not expensive. You can you can download it. You can also buy uh, you know uh, the hardcover or the soft cover of it. Um, but it was great. I worked on it for three years. Um, basically, a year to, to write it and two years to edit it, and it was a it was a blast. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Dave. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or mention that we haven't covered here? I don't think so. I'm just. Uh, I hope you're excited uh, that uh, people who are watching this are. Um, so again, I'd like to apologize for the uh, the cold that I'm fighting here, but um, I uh, I just want to say thank you to uh, folks for for bothering to watch this and. To you, Matt, for um, for taking it up and, uh, and being willing to interview me, and I hope that you enjoy the new version of Shadowgate. Um, you know that we're in pre-production on, and um, you know uh, if you go to zojoy.com, which is z-o-j-o-i.com, you can sign up for our newsletter and learn more about our games. And um, just you know, if you can help support any development, um, that would be awesome. <laughs> And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a new retrospective, so if there's a game you'd like to see on the show, just uh, send me a little video of yourself. Uh, tell me who you are, where you're from, and the game you like to see. And who knows, it could be the subject of the next Match Chat retrospective. So thank you guys for sending those in. As always, I want to thank you if you have supported the show financially. If you'd like to do that, just go to armchairarcade.com, look for the Match Chat link in the top right corner. You can uh, make a one-time donation or set up a subscription. Either way, I really, really appreciate it. You guys are keeping these shows coming, so thank you very much. A couple of uh, news announcements, too. Uh, one is my book, Honoring the Code, Conversations with Great Game Designers, is uh, now available for pre-order through Amazon. Uh, I'll have more information about that as it gets a little later in the, in the process, but if you want to make sure that you can get it as soon as it comes out, uh, go over there and pre-order it. If you like the show and these interviews, I don't know why you wouldn't want to have this book. I uh, hope I've, the cover is <laughs> covers great. Uh, there's also lots of uh, photographs and uh, biographical information about the, the guests on there and lots of other stuff. Even even has an index, so I know you guys are going to like that. Uh, go if you want. If you want the book, uh, go to Amazon and pre-order it. Uh, also, uh, Janelle Jakeways, I had her on the show, uh, I guess it's been a while, I don't remember exactly when I had her on, uh, but she's, of course, uh, well known for her fantasy art. Uh, she's launching a new Kickstarter to uh, fund a cover. Uh, one of her friends apparently is doing a, a novel, and uh, she wants Janelle to do the artwork, uh, but of course Janelle can't do this for free. Uh, so this Kickstarter... If you uh, support this, you can get a poster of uh, the whatever the cover art ends up being, a lot of other nice things, and get copies of the novel, of course. Uh, so I just thought I would mention that for anyone interested. I'll post uh, the links uh, to the Kickstarter in the show notes. Okay, wow. Whew. Okay, what about that ale of the week? Uh, this is another one of uh, Herbert's uh, selections. Uh, Herbert's a really fantastic guy. He sent me a huge, huge uh, stash. Uh, of ales uh, to try. Uh, this one is a Tokyo Rising Sun. 
Highland Cask Aged. Uh, this is a 13.2% alcohol. Another one from Brewdog, by the way. I think I like Brewdog's uh, ale so much. I really, <laughs> if I was a millionaire, I'd just buy the buy the place. Uh, they're really that that good. Uh, this one has a interesting uh, story behind it. It's even numbered. I don't know if you can see this, but there's this is apparently bottle 20, uh, 2,101. Okay, so what is this? They've brewed it in a Highland whiskey cask, uh, which they claim results in a vicious slow motion roller coaster of powdered cacao, hints of burning pirate ships, salted caramel, sharp berries, and toasted marshmallow. Wow, that sounds interesting indeed. Uh, so anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Tokyo Rising Sun here in the old rather excellent drinking horn. I gotta say, uh, this does not smell very good. It's a, uh, it smells kind of like, I used to work in a sawmill at one point, and they would have chemicals that they would put on the, the wood, I guess, to keep it from rotting, or, you know, I don't really know, understand the chemistry of it, uh, but it kind of has that sort of industrial uh, factory smell to it. Can't say that's uh, very promising. You know, and there's also little chunks uh, floating in this. I don't know if that's some some uh, some of the little chunks of the cask uh, that they brewed this in. But anyway, uh, let's give it a taste. Uh, <laughs> maybe Herbert's trying to kill me here, but anyway, here's to you, uh, Herbert. Ah, ah, ah! Man, that is. Uh, I'm gonna just say this is nasty. A uh, very nasty. <laughs> <laughs> strong alcohol flavor, a sort of strange taste. Maybe it's from those uh, casks of uh, <laughs> scotch, Highland scotch or something. Maybe they didn't really wash those uh, casks out very well because you definitely taste a lot of that whiskey or whatever it is. Uh, definitely wouldn't want to drink a whole bottle of this by myself. Uh, <laughs> I probably will anyway. <laughs> uh, but this is probably going to knock me completely... Uh, senseless by the time I'm done with this. So maybe I should just uh, take one one little sip and then uh, I'll give you my rate. Oh, damn. Okay. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, what to, damn. Uh, what to give this one? I would uh, say just, I wouldn't give it any horns at all if you're just looking for something really pleasant uh, to sip on. A uh, very strong, very foul, uh, on the other hand, if you're if you like a challenge, uh, you want to go for something uh, complex and sophisticated that will uh, make you feel more manly. I guess you know this would be a good uh, selection. I'm gonna go. Uh, I guess one out of five uh, horns on this. I'll give it a horn just because it's interesting. I haven't ever tasted anything re remotely like this one. Uh, but you probably don't want to, uh, you know, to get a big six pack of these things. Uh, definitely not. But anyway, thank you, Herbert. That was uh, definitely an interesting experience. All right, for the quotation, I'm actually going to read a little quotation from uh, the Solstice Treaty, uh, which uh, Dave uh, was kind enough to send me. He's got quotations in here from various people, and here's one that I, I liked right from the start of the book. Uh, this is Sir Winston Churchill, and it goes something like this. It is a mistake to try to look too far ahead. The chain of destiny can only be grasped one link at a time. See you guys next week. My dear, I don't think he's as stupid as he seems. My dear, nobody could be as stupid as he seems. Oh.